Good morning, everyone, and welcome. The topic of today's online event is Behind the Label, Inside Organic Food Production. This webinar is part of the public education series sponsored by UFA Cooperative Limited. My name is Brandy Yanchik, and I'm an independent journalist and documentary filmmaker based in Edmonton, Alberta, in the Treaty 6 territory. I'd like to acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footprints have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Neheyao, Cree, Diné, Anishinaabe, Sotu, Nakota Ishka, Nakota Sioux, and Nisitapi, Blackfoot people. I also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and the home of one of the largest communities of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. Before I introduce today's panelists, a couple of quick housekeeping items. If you're having di difficulties hearing the webinar today or are experiencing an unreliable internet signal, you can always use the call-in number in your webinar registration email or click the arrow next to the microphone icon and press switch to phone audio. There is a box labeled Q&A where you can pose questions to the panelists. If you see a question in the Q&A box that you think is important to ask, you can also click the thumbs up icon to move it to the front of the queue. We will also have a couple of poll questions for you. Today's event will consist of presentations by our panelists, followed by question and answer sessions after each presentation. After the two presentations and question and answer sessions, we will move on to a panel discussion. Please be aware that this event is being recorded, and the recording will be uploaded to YouTube, and you will receive the link in an email and a post-event survey. We will also take clips from the video and post them on social media. We hope that today's event promotes more discussion with diverse participants. Today, I am pleased to introduce two distinguished speakers for our discussion. Both speakers are experts in their respective fields and will present valuable insights relevant to today's topic. Additionally, they will be available for a Q&A session and panel discussions following their presentations, during which they will provide further clarity and answer any questions you might have. Our first speaker is Erin McGregor, a dietitian who specializes in home economics, food and nutrition communications and consulting. Erin has extensive experience educating the public about healthy eating habits and debunking nutrition related misinformation. Her work includes public outreach, podcast hosting and consulting, where she shares her expertise to help people make informed dietary choices. And our second speaker is Dr. Bonnie J. Kaplan, Professor Emeritus at the Cumming School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. Bonnie is a well-regarded nutrition and mental health researcher, focusing on how diet impacts brain function. Her commitment to researching the role of nutrition and mental well-being provides fascinating insights into how our eating affects our mental health. Welcome, everyone. Now, before we begin, we have a poll question for the audience. The question is, which farming practice is often associated with organic food production? One, use of genetically modified seeds. Two, synthetic herbicide use. Three, crop rotation to maintain soil health. Or four, monoculture farming. You now have 30 seconds to answer the poll, after which we will, we will display those results. Poll is now ending. Okay. So we see that 0% uh, of participants said that the use of genetic genetically modified seeds is often associated with organic food production. 9% of participants said that synthetic herbicide use is often associated with organic food production. 82% of participants said that crop rotation to maintain soil health is often associated with organic food production, and 9% of participants said that monoculture farming is often associated with organic food production.
And the answer to the poll is three, crop rotation to maintain soil health is often associated with organic food production. And you will learn more about this in today's webinar. And now invite Erin to start the discussion. As you listen to her presentation, please consider some questions you'd like to ask her and put them in the Q&A box. In your question, please tell us your name and a bit about yourself, such as your location and your profession. Thank you, Erin. Hello, and thank you so much, Brandy. That was a lovely introduction. I'm going to share my screen and get started right away. Bear with me, please. Okay, I believe everyone will be able to see that. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm very, I'm very excited to speak about this topic. Uh, but before I begin, I think it's really important that I provide some context about why I'm speaking on this topic. Because I am not an expert when it comes to agriculture. Um, I grew up in an urban area and have spent almost my entire adult life in Toronto. I've, I've moved to a rural area a couple of years ago and I love it. Um, but before, about 10 years ago, I'd never even stepped on a farm. Now, I've worked as a dietitian in a hospital, in the community, and in the online and social media space for about 15 years. And in all of these settings, my job is to help translate the science of food and nutrition for my patients and my clients and for the general public. And what I realized really early on in my career is that people have questions about their food that extends way beyond nutrition content. They want to know more than just how many grams of protein are in a meal. They want to know more than how to manage disease and health conditions with their diet. People are interested in where their food comes from and how it's produced. Um, they're interested in whether the ingredients they're using are safe for their children who they're feeding. And I find increasingly they want to know that if what they're eating has social or environmental impacts. Now, <clears throat> when I was a new dietitian, I was completely unequipped to answer any questions about food production. In fact, most dietetic training programs in Canada um, do not have any mandatory food systems training. And so I really didn't have any meaningful knowledge about agriculture or food production. And as a result, I gathered information from what I now recognize are biased sources, and I was really guilty. I spread misinformation about food production topics, including organic food, genetically modified foods, um, and pesticide residues that were not evidence-based. Now, over the last dozen years or so, primarily out of interest, I've immersed myself in learning more about food production. Um, and in fact, the agriculture industry has really been working towards engaging dietitians specifically in agriculture education. And that's really because they've realized we are the consumer facing food professionals. So we need to be equipped to answer questions about food production. Consumers and farmers, unfortunately, just don't have a dialogue. Now, I visited farms, um, both organic and conventional, as well as biotechnology facilities across Canada and the US in this time. And I've learned directly from those working in the industry, the farmers, the scientists, uh, the agronomists, the regulatory affairs specialist. Um, and with that knowledge, I've been working on sharing better, more consumer friendly and evidence-based information on topics related to food production, like organic foods. So questions like, is organic food better? Is it safer? Is it more nutritious? These are all questions that I'm regularly faced with, with all of my different areas of practice. Uh, and if I'm being honest, most of the time, they're being asked with the assumption that my answer is going to be yes. So that's what I'd like to talk about. Now, very briefly, this is what I'll touch on today. We'll touch base on what does organic mean in Canada? What are the regulations? Um, we'll look at some of the organic production criteria, and then we'll talk about some of the trade-offs. So what does it mean to choose organic food over conventionally grown food? We'll also talk about uh, organic labeling and what the current trade rules are. And then finally, I'll bring it all back together and kind of give you my two cents on whether or not we should choose organic. Now, organic food production is very highly regulated in Canada, and it is overseen by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. 
Um, all of the regulatory requirements can be found in a document called the Canadian Organic Standards. And this document comes in two parts. So the first is the general principles and management standards. And this outlines the requirements for um, crop production, including things like land requirements, uh, nutrient management, fertilization, crop protection, so weed and pest management, things like irrigation, livestock production. Uh, it includes healthcare, housing and transportation for animals. And it also includes the processing, the documentation and the handling methods required to maintain that organic integrity through all stages of production, so from farm to fork. The second piece is the permitted substances list, and this is a 75-page document that includes all of the substances that are, are approved for use in organic production. So this would include crop production aids like fertilizers and pesticides. Um, it would include animal feed and animal healthcare products like pain medications, antibiotics. The important thing to note here when considering this standard is when you choose organic versus conventional, you are simply choosing a crop production method. So these are not regulations that speak to the safety, the quality, or the nutrient content of the end product, organic food. In fact, on the very first page of the Canadian Organic Standards, this is made pretty explicit. Neither this standard nor organic products produced in according with this standard represents specific claims about the healthiness, the safety, or the nutrition of such organic products. So this single sentence really immediately answers many of the questions I get about organic food. Is it healthier? Is it safer? Is it more nutritious? Well, no, not necessarily. The principal goal of organic production, according to the standard, is to develop operations that are sustainable and harmonious with the environment. And I definitely can't deny that this is a worthwhile cause. Now let's review some of the criteria for organic food production. So this list has been simplified to really highlight some of the production methods that typically concern, concern consumers. So the first is the avoid the use of synthetic pesticides for production, growth, animal health, and food processing. So this would include pesticides, fertilizers, growth hormones, and certain medications like antibiotics. Next, prohibit all of the products of genetic engineering. So these are commonly known as GMOs, uh, but more recently it would also include the products of gene editing. And then finally, to ensure livestock are provided with organic feed, living conditions, and space allowances appropriate to their behavioral requirements. Now, I think it's really important to kind of work through each of this criteria and talk about trade-offs, meaning by choosing organic food instead of conventionally grown food, what are we giving up? You know, every decision made by a farmer to produce food involves a trade-off. So that trade-off could be time, it could be money, it could be yield, it could be sustainability, it could be a mix of all of these things. For consumers, the primary and most obvious trade-off is cost. Organic food is significantly more expensive than conventionally grown food. Uh, and price is still the number one factor in decision making for food for Canadians. So buying organic then needs to feel worth it. If we know that it's not necessarily safer or more nutritious, then these cri other criteria need to be enough to make it feel like a worthwhile decision. So we'll address the criteria around pesticides first. It is a very common myth, particularly among consumers, that organic production methods are pesticide free. There are generally fewer pesticides used in organic production, um, as growers are only permitted to use a restricted list of pesticides, so from that permitted substances list, and most of which are naturally derived. But this leads right into the second myth about organic food, that organic pesticides are natural and therefore safer. Now, whether a pesticide is naturally derived or synthetic tells us absolutely nothing about its safety. Both are made up entirely of chemicals and many naturally produced chemicals found in bacteria and uh, fungi and plants are not safe for human consumption. So the safety of any chemical depends on its composition, on our level of exposure to it and whether that level of exposure can cause harm. Every pesticide, whether they are organic or conventional, 
must go through the same regulatory process and have to be approved by Canada's Pest Management Regulatory Agency. So this is a division of Health Canada. They are extensively reviewed for safety. In fact, it takes about 12 years for a new pesticide to be approved for use because of all of the regulatory requirements. And this process considers both short and long-term health effects on people at all stages of life, as well as potential environmental impacts. And then once they're approved, they're regularly reviewed as well. So what are some of the trade-offs of limiting synthetic pesticide use? Um, well, prohibiting the use of some modern pesticides often requires more land to produce equivalent yield. So that could potentially lead to deforestation or just loss of habitat. Additionally, organic farming may rely more on heavy on tillage, so the mechanical removal of weeds, meaning this disrupts the soil. It can contribute to soil erosion, um, to nutrient loss, as well as to greenhouse gas emissions. And then finally, limiting one pesticide doesn't necessarily mean the farmer isn't going to replace it with an alternative, a natural organic alternative, or even more than one pesticide, since organic pesticide may be less effective. Now, what about the restriction of gene engineering, genetic engineering technology? Well, first, I think it's really important to review that G GMOs are safe. Um, they have been evaluated by Health Canada, international governments, and scientists for over 30 years now. Um, and the scientific consensus is very clear that GMOs or foods um, created from genetically engineered products pose no more risk to human health than non-GMO foods and they are equally as nutritious. Globally, there have been trillions of meals consumed containing GMOs without any evidence of a negative health impact. So what do we miss out on with the restriction of genetically engineered products? Well, we could be missing out on crops that are insect and disease resistant, resulting in less crop loss, meaning less land is needed for the same yield, um, and it can also reduce pesticide use. Uh, we may be missing out on crops engineered to be herbicide tolerant, which allow farmers to more effectively control weeds without having to mechanically, mechanically remove them. It's called no-till farming. Um, now, this has helped advance sustainable agriculture by improving soil health, retaining moisture, and reducing greenhouse gases. Crops that are better adapted to climate change um, and resistant to environmental stresses like drought or heat or flooding. Uh, we may be missing out on food that has enhanced nutrient content. I'm interested in that, um, including vitamin A enhanced golden rice um, or omega-3 rich soybeans. And we may be missing out on crops with increased durability and non-browning traits. And these can significantly reduce food waste um, from, from bruising during harvesting as well as handling. And as you can see, a lot of these traits improve environmental sustainability, which is the goal of organic agriculture. Now, finally, when it comes to animal welfare, the organic standards for ensuring specific living conditions for livestock really just seem to imply that standards either aren't in place or they're insufficient for conventionally produced um, uh, animals. Now, animal welfare is a concern for all farmers. I think all producers want happy, healthy animals. They grow better, they are less sick, they produce more. It is in the farmer's best interest to care for their animals. Now in Canada, animal welfare regulations are, um, are provincial legislation, under provincial legislation, um, but regardless of production method, the evidence indicates that there is no impact on safety or nutrition in the final product. Now, organic standards regulate um, things like space required, that uh, the animal's feed must be organic, and it prohibits things like growth hormones and some medications. But it may not be, it's not an all encompassing document on animal welfare. So it may not address specific concerns that consumers have about outdoor access or transportation um, or breeding or physical alterations of the animal. Now, what's the bottom line? Well, it's important to consider the trade offs because it's really not a simple equation when you have more information about those food production methods. Um, one thing we can be assured of in Canada is that no matter which food production method you choose, you are going to be choosing safe, nutritious food. Um, what we can see, though, is that by prohibiting some modern food technology, uh, production technology, 
organic food doesn't necessarily reflect the best way to produce food, even from an environmental standpoint. I like to look at it this way. I have had many great conversations with many farmers, um, and I think it's really crucial to understand that at the end of the day, farmers choose what they grow. Um, and when I ask farmers why they grow what they grow, no two answers are alike. There are farmers who choose to grow using organic principles, but don't seek certification because it is cost and time prohibitive. There are farmers who choose to seek organic certification so that they can reach a niche market uh, where consumers are willing to pay a premium. And this is part of running a successful business. Um, some farmers choose to use the most innovative and tech forward options available in order to improve quality, uh, yield, sustainability, sometimes all at once. And these options may not be permitted under organic standards. And then some choose to grow a mix of organic and conventional uh, farming principles based on a number of things, their geography, their personal beliefs, their family history, what their agronomists recommend, um, you know, what they like to eat, what you like to eat and whatever makes the most business sense, and a slew of other reasons. But in all of these scenarios, you will find the word choose. Farmers choose. And because they get to choose, we get to choose. And so I, in my opinion, when it comes to food, it's a pretty amazing time to be alive. Now let's shift back towards some regulatory stuff, um, but this time we're gonna focus on what happens when foods hit the grocery store shelves. When it comes to labeling, um, the guidelines are really straightforward for the organic label. They don't leave a lot of room for misinterpretation. Anything that's labeled organic has to be certified by an accredited certification body. This is done through the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to meet these can Canadian organic standards. Terms like organically grown, raised, produced are all considered the same as are symbols or phonetic renderings of the word. Um, the term certified organic is not allowed because it implies that just labeling something organic is not certified or regulated. And then the use of the Canada organic logo re requires very specific criteria. These criteria apply to products that have an organic claim on the label or are sold between provinces or territories or imported into Canada. Also applies to any product displaying the Canada organic logo. And it all comes down really to the percentage of organic content in a product. So um, for something to be able to carry the label organic or the Canada organic logo, it has to have at least 95% or more organic content. If it's between 70 and 95%, it can list contains X number of organic ingredients on the label, but it can't use the logo. And if it's less than 70% organic content, the only thing they can do is list the organic ingredients in the ingredient list. They can't label it organic. They cannot use the organic logo. In terms of organic trade, Canada has equivalency agreements with a number of countries that certify products in a very similar fashion. Um, and this allows the use of the Canada organic logo. Um, the important thing to hear, though, is to note that just because something has the Canada organic logo does not mean it is a product of Canada. Now, organic products sold within provinces are not covered unless there is a provincial body that um, for organic legislation. And these don't exist in every province, currently just in BC, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Quebec. Um, but that being said, there is an overarching standard from the Food and Drug Act and from the Safe Food for Canadians Act that tells us we can't use misleading or deceptive food marketing. So it's covered in a way there. So I'll bring it all back to some final thoughts about organic food. In the end, do I have a problem with organic guidelines or labeling? Absolutely not. The guidelines are clear and straightforward. Do I have a problem with the sentiment that organic equals better? Yes, because we know it's equally as healthy and safe and nutritious and the environmental benefits are not straightforward. Should there be separate regulations for organically grown food? I'm not sure, but I don't think that it better informs consumers, particularly with all of the fear-based marketing that exists and pushes people towards organic. I do think that the organic movement has been really successful in helping consumers think more about their food, where it comes from, and asking more questions, and also just de demanding better standards for human, animal, and environmental health. 
Um, but personally, I would like to see more common sense regulations that really include a mix of organic and conventional practices based on each unique farming scenario. So I don't think it has to be an organic versus conventional debate. And finally, should we eat organic? Well, I definitely don't think that uh, there's an objectively correct decision or piece of advice here. I think it is a personal choice, but one that is not necessary for health. Um, what I will say is that when it comes to health, it is, is that Canadians really struggle with achieving a good quality diet, including just eating enough fruits and vegetables. And so the priority should really be helping Canadians just eat more fruits and vegetables, regardless of what the production method is. Um, personally, I eat organic. I eat conventional food without discrimination. For me, the priorities are taste, um, affordability, uh, convenience, but I support the farmers growing all of it. So I'm going to include a list of resources too, which I believe you'll have access to after the presentation. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erin. That was an excellent presentation and lots to digest. And also now with the rising cost of food, I'm sure lots of people uh, think twice about what they can afford. There's so much uh, information that you gave us. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, we do have a question from the audience. We have a uh, question from Tatenda Mambo. Uh, Tatenda is actually from the Simpson Center. Can you speak to the use of non-organic materials, such as manure in organic production, and whether this creates inconsistency? For example, Highline Mushroom Farm uses chicken manure from conventional operations to organically grow their mushrooms. So the question is, can you speak to the use of non-organic materials such as manure in organic production and whether that creates inconsistency? It may, I mean, I don't have a full scope of every piece of um, criteria that's in the Canadian organic standard. But I do know that non-organic materials um, can be used in specific circumstances. But the people who regulate or who have put together this Canadian organic standard have basically all come together and have agreed upon certain concepts. There are some synthetic pesticides that are allowed to be used in organic farming as well. So that you might talk about a little bit about inconsistency there. Um, yeah, so yes, there may be some inconsistency, but I think all of it is to achieve kind of the goal of um, you know, having more environment, environmental sustainability. It's more about the overall philosophy. Um, but I think that's the thing. It doesn't, the organic label doesn't necessarily better inform consumers because some inconsistencies like that do, do exist. So we have another question for you, Erin. Thank you for answering that one. You mentioned the requirements for organic feed, living conditions, and space allowances for livestock in organic farming. What challenges might farmers face in meeting these standards while maintaining economic viability? Yeah, I mean, it's all expenses. It's all very expensive, right? So each step, like, it requires more space. It requires more expensive um you know, there may be more expense in labor as well, since um, you may need to hire people to create more, to have more organic production. And on top of that, the documentation standards in the organic standard are really stringent and require a lot more time and energy than some of the conventionally grown products. So all along the way, the process is more expensive. But at the same time, we have a product that consumers are willing to pay more for. So it must be worth it for these farmers to choose to grow organically and to make a business out of it because they know they can hit this niche market and, they, and consumers are willing to pay more for these products. Thank you so much, Erin, for telling us all this information. We've got so much to think about. This has been such a, an engaging, ses engaging session so far, but uh, we're going to do another quick poll question before we hear from our next speaker. And you're going to have 30 seconds to answer that poll question. And the question is, how might herbicide use indirectly impact human nutrition? One, by increasing the vitamin content of crops. Two, by reducing the availability of essential soil nutrients for crops. Three, by enhancing the protein level levels in crops. And or, or four, by improving crop shelf life. So again, the question is, how might herbicide use indirectly impact human nutrition? You have 30 seconds.
Okay, the poll is now ending. In response to the question, how might herbicide use indirectly impact human nutrition? 8% of participants said that herbicide use direct, indirectly impacts human nutrition by increasing the vitamin content of crops. 77% of participants said that herbicide use indirectly impacts human nutrition by reducing the availability of essential soil nutrients for crops. 4% of participants said that herbicide use indirectly impacts human nutrition by enhancing the protein levels in crops. And 12% of participants said that herbicide use indirectly impacts human nutrition by improving crop shelf life. And the answer is that herbicide use indirectly impacts human nutrition by reducing the availability of essential soil nutrients for crops. Thank you, everybody, for sending in your answers. I'll now invite Bonnie to do her presentation. Please remember to type your questions in the Q&A box. When you ask your question, please tell us your name and a bit about yourself, such as your location and your profession. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a comment about um, to say thank you for inviting me to give this talk because I spend, uh, I'm in retirement now, and I spend a lot of time trying to influence policymakers. So you had me when you told me that your center was named um, the Simpson Center for Food and Agricultural Policy. You're the people that I want to learn more about the importance of everything that Aaron was talking about and everything else that our food producers talked to us about. Very important for our society's brain health. So. Um, I have to start in my world, I have to start with the disclosure slide at all times. Uh, I have no commercial interest in any company or the sale of any product. And I will be mentioning probably one or two products, but I'm not affiliated with them. Um, whoops, sorry, I went backwards. Um, I am, you know, obviously talking to people about taking a look at the book I published recently with my former student, Professor Julia Rutledge who is at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, but any proceeds from that book are going into a charitable fund to fund research being done on micronutrient, meaning mineral and vitamin treatment of mental disorders. And that's been going very well. Actually, I've raised over a million dollars, but distributed every penny of it to support my junior colleagues. So what I'm gonna talk about is how nutrition can improve brain health. And basically, I'm very briefly about improving nutrient density in our food supply. Kudos to the 77% of people who seem to be somewhat aware of that in the uh, poll that was just provided. Mostly, I'm going to talk about um, improving nutrient density by making the right food choices. So I think this audience already knows this. I'm going to say it very fast. Our health is found as a function of our topsoil. This thin skin of about 10 inches of topsoil around our entire globe, um, if it's very healthy, it contains about 15 minerals. And that's what we need because in bringing it down now to our food production, if there are about 15 minerals in the soil along with a lot of the other little microorganisms, then those plants will be able to synthesize the roughly 15 vitamins that we need in our crops. And so a healthy crop will have about 30 minerals and vitamins. And when I'm speaking of formulas that provide multi-nutrients, that's what I'm talking about, providing our brains all 30 minerals and vitamins. A little bit about our soil though, um, I'm not, I'm just gonna show you a couple slides because this was Erin's bailiwick, which she handled so well. Um, but there are a lot of factors that are depleting the nutrients in our soil. We don't have perfect data on showing that um, our soil all over the world is depleted, but there's enough data that a lot of people are concerned. So it's overuse, erosion, runoff, burning crop residues, any farming practices that don't replenish soil nutrients, they're all a concern. And by the way, global warming is a concern because especially in studies in rice fields, we found, or researchers have found that rising levels of CO2 results in 
what one of my colleagues recently called little sugar bombs, um, products which are or produce, which have an awful lot of sugars, but don't have time to really incorporate, I guess, all the vitamins and minerals that we hope are there. What's controversial is whether or not the binding or chelating of minerals caused by glyphosate, the most prominent herbicide that's out there, um, whether that is also a significant factor. The problem is that we consumers cannot walk into a grocery store and evaluate the nutrient density of the produce that's sitting there. If we could, we could answer a lot more questions. But if I go around with a little bricks meter and poke holes in all the apples before I decide which ones to buy, I might be sent away from that grocery store. So we need better ways for the public to influence nutrient density. There are many modern approaches to improving the nutrient density of crops. Uh, Aaron spoke to you in detail about organic ag. You may be aware that there's regenerative agriculture movement. Some people call it biodynamic agriculture, sustainable agriculture. Most of them look at incorporating no-till practices, remineralizing the soil, Many of them use Albrecht um, balancing. Uh, here in Western Canada, some people are beginning to use the injection of biostimulants. So there are lots of practices. Organic is just one kind of label that the public has become aware of. But let's talk about why it's important. This is what matters to me. What is our society eating? Fortunately, we have some information, but it is the most disturbing data that I've seen in recent years. So here in a nutshell, this is from Canada, the Canadian Community Health Survey in 2000, 2017. Data were published to show that 48% of what our society is consuming is from ultra-processed packages. Some people call it ultra-processed food. I can't stand that term, UPS because it's not food. It's not, I mean, the definition of food is something that helps our cells grow and be maintained. And what you're looking at in this picture is doing nothing for ourselves. So let's not call it UPS. It's ultra processed rubbish, packages of chemicals, sugar, and salt. The US data, they've been doing NHANES, that's the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey for 50 years now, since 1971. And they divide it by age a little more clearly. And this came out in, these are major, you know, A-list journals um, just in the last few years. And it's shocking. Look at our children. 67% of their caloric intake comes from nutrient-free food. Or maybe I should say nutrient-poor packaged chemicals. What are we doing to our children? I find that really quite terrifying, and adults are not doing much better. So we all know that nutrition is the foundation of our resilience. That's why we are so quick to try to provide food for people who've been displaced by wildfires or wars, etc. We know that that's true. So don't you wonder what happens to people whose nutrient intake is only, let's say, half, okay? Only half of what it should or could be. In our children, it's only a third, which is even scarier because their brains are supposedly still developing. We know the answer to this question if we look at history. And it's also very disturbing. But this is from the University of Minnesota starvation experiments. These were done after World War II when people who survived the concentration camps Many of them were refed and died as a result. So there was a need to try to understand what starvation did to the gastrointestinal tract. And they did a whole lot of studies in Minnesota on that. But one of those studies also looked at mental health. And this was a study of 36 normal healthy men who agreed to move onto campus and live in some barracks underneath or next to really um, a playing field and have their food restricted. And they agreed to a restriction of 50% of their normal caloric and also nutrient intake. So it's not a perfect analogy, but it's close. 
it's the closest we can come because nobody can do this study again because no ethics committee would approve it, of course. And so they did that for six months and this is what happened. When you look at these words, you should be thinking about depression, anxiety, and we don't use all these words anymore. This is a 1950s term, hysteria, and also characteristic of ADHD, an ability to concentrate and focus. But here's the really worrisome thing. It was 100% of the participants. Well, right now, we are at a current mental health rate, according to the World Health Organization, lifetime prevalence of mental disorders has reached 50%. Does that mean we could go to 100%? I'm not going to make any predictions, but I find it disturbing because when I was in training, and I know I'm ancient, but I'm not that ancient, the, the prevalence rate of mental disorders, the point prevalence was less than 3%. So there's been a tremendous change with the change of our dietary choices. In order to tell you why this is so important for brain health, I need to say a word or two about metabolism. Metabolism is just a fancy word to mean a transformation of one compound to another. If you have chemical A, it has to be converted to chemical B. In mammalian physiology, these are virtually all enzymatic reactions. But what people don't know is that enzymes can't work alone. It's like an engine that needs gas. Enzymes need an abundant supply of cofactors. Cofactors is a term that I think should be taught in grade, starting in about grade three, um, because then children would understand why they need to eat a healthy diet. Minerals and vitamins are in all the cofactors. And then you get your transformation. So I'm going to illustrate one example. I want you to know the context for this slide which ordinarily you probably are not used to looking at. But in about 20 years ago, I was giving a lot of talks to lay audiences, um, meaning people who were not academic scientists as I was. And I wanted to be sure they understood something about cofactors. So I, I understood that most people knew what serotonin was, that's why it's in red, and melatonin and tryptophan, that's why they're in red. And we don't need to worry about the words in black, which are more complicated. And I asked the question, if you look at a very oversimplified corner of tryptophan metabolism, what cofactors can we find that incorporate vitamins and minerals? So this is what I found. Every arrow is a metabolic step. Every arrow has an enzyme or more than one, but these are the cofactors that are required for this step to occur. Here you have three minerals. Here you have a B vitamin. Here you have two B vitamins and a mineral, another B vitamin. Here you have two B vitamins and a trace mineral you've probably never heard of. Have you had your molybdenum today? If you've been eating a lot of vegetables and fruit, you probably have. Zinc is down here, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, every step required sometimes many vitamins and minerals or else it simply does not work efficiently. And this is the slide that a lot of people say is their aha moment. They understand finally why what they eat matters. I was taught you have to eat a healthy diet for strong bones and muscles. Well, I have nothing against strong bones and muscles, but I now know that we were eating for our brains. Our brains are less than 3% of our body weight, and yet they demand more than 20 to 30% of the metabolic uh, demands come from the brain. Sorry, I got that sentence tangled up, but I think you know what I mean. Now, what is the evidence base? There are approximately 100 peer-reviewed studies in the last 20 years, and I can't even I don't even have time to show you the, all the categories. But what's interesting is that they're blackballed by the media. And I, I genuinely knew that, mean that. The media doesn't want, they want to, to cover the next great drug for psychiatric problems. They don't want to know what nutrients do for the brain. And so 
in those hundred studies, I have seen only one covered by the international media in 20 years. And it's, that's why my physician colleagues say there's no evidence that nutrition affects mental health. Well, there is evidence. What they're really saying is they haven't read it. And that brings up another kind of dark side of this story because the reason they haven't read the evidence is because they don't read the journals. They read what the drug companies give them. So there are four categories for the evidence base. I'm not going to mention the first two because they don't prove causality. So I'm going to go to the highest level of evidence and try to show you one study in each of the two categories. Prospective longitudinal studies show that you can look at healthy people and evaluate their diet and predict who's going to have a mental health problem. And then I'll show you a treatment study in the fourth category. So the prospective longitudinal study that I selected, first of all, was published in the highest level pediatric journal in North America. Secondly is Canadian data. And thirdly is with the youngest people who have been studied in this way. And again, it's disturbing that we're doing this to our young children. These were over 3000 children in Nova Scotia. They were evaluated for nine, whether or not they met nine guidelines of health. Six of those were dietary. The other three were screen time and physical activity. And then the researchers went away and they came back. They evaluated them for the nine, okay, and categorized everyone. But they went away and they came back in 2014, pulled the administrative health data and said, well, which of those healthy children healthy in 2011, which of them were referred to a physician to be diagnosed for a mental or behavioral health problem? And the senior author on this paper gave me this slide to use in teaching. It's a bit of a cartoon. His name's Dr. Paul Voiglers. He's at University of Alberta. And so there's no uh, metric on the y-axis, which might look strange to some of you. But what they showed was the children who in 2011 met one, two, or three guidelines, which is not very many, of course, were arbitrarily set at this risk level. And then they asked the question, well, how about the kids who met four, five, or six guidelines? And there was a 39% reduction in referral to a physician for a mental health problem. If they met seven, eight, or nine, there was more than a 50% reduction. And then they did an analysis of variance. And here's the policy implication for anyone out there who can influence mental health treatment. Every additional recommendation that was associated with 15% fewer physician visits. Now, first of all, think of the family suffering. And secondly, think about our healthcare budget. And I've published data from some very impactful case studies studied over a very long period of time, showing that in some cases we can actually save over 90% of mental health treatment costs. It's very hard to get the attention of people who are setting policy. Now, do I have time to show you one more? Um, I'll try and I'll see if, if they ask me to stop talking. Okay. You have about one My minute, Bonnie. So you'll okay, have to go quickly, I'm gonna, please. I'm going to jump. This just came out. It's not in our book, even though Julia Rutledge is the co-author of the book is the senior author. And what they did is they showed that they could improve the mental health in a fully blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trial of pregnant women. But I'm going to jump to... The recent data they published on the babies at six months, it's amazing. So the babies whose mothers were given micronutrients throughout pregnancy had much better emotional self-regulation, recovery from habituation to scary or startling stimuli compared to those who had been exposed only to the placebo or a third group whose mothers were given psychiatric medication, which is the traditional treatment. The second one shows also autonomic stability for those much better, those who got micronutrients compared to placebo or medication and motor skills also superior. And they published a lot more data, but I wanted you to see those. So 
I'm going to end with resources and I'm going to read this slide from right to left because there's so much I couldn't cover. I want to draw your attention to my website. All you need to know is my middle initial to find me, but if you don't have it, you won't. I have lots of videos there that give you more information, the peer reviewed publications, and you can contact me. Julia has a TEDx talk that has been seen over 5 million times. I recommend that. Also a mass open online course. This is a conversation.com piece. And of course, if you care to read our book that's not written for scientists, it's written for the lay public, you can find that. All of that is on my website. And I thank you. I look forward to your questions. So fascinating, Bonnie. I'm going to pick up that book. Um, I have to tell you, I've already ordered it from the Edmonton Public Library. It was there, <laughs> but um, we have a question from the audience. Can Bonnie explain more about the injection of biostimulants that she mentioned? This is from Natasha in Edmonton who grows vegetables in her backyard garden. And she's curious about what you meant of injection of biostimulants. Um. I am, this is not my field, as you know from the rest of my talk, but uh, I have visited uh, uh, food producers on a variety of farms and met a very interesting family. I can put you in touch with them. Their last name is Let, L-E-T-T, -T, and at the moment I'm forgetting their first names or the name of their company, but uh, I was able to see the fields that they had um, injected with biostimulants to increase the activity of the microbes in the soil. So if you email me through my website, I can give you the link for that. I'm sorry, I can't say it off the top of my head. Thank you so much, Bonnie. That was such a fascinating presentation. And we know you have so much more that you could share with us. So I hope that people do check out the Better Brain book and go to those other links that you sent to us. But now we're going to move on to the question and answer session. And I'm asking that people please uh, put question and answers into their um into the chat that and also tell us a little bit about yourself. So the first question I have is, are there specific, oh, sorry, here we go, I'm getting an alert. So Aaron, okay, I get alerts uh, behind the scenes, by the way, if you're ever wondering what I'm doing here, but so Aaron, Michael McGee said that he is delighted to hear your balanced approach between the relative health of organic and non-organic production. It is also encouraging to see the trend towards the acceptance of gene editing technologies and their potential benefits, including in Europe, where opposition to GMOs was so prevalent. Can you speak to the challenges and in particular, the expense and the need for more enhanced, oops, uh, veracity of validating of the organic labeling. So can you speak to the challenges and in particular, the expense and need for enhanced veracity of validation of the, of, of the organic labeling? This is for Aaron from Michael McGee. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Um, I, I know that there's been a lot of uh, movement in acceptance of uh, plant science, including genetic engineering all over the world. Um, you know, previous moves by some places in Europe to ban GMOs, um, you know, all that, all, all of that, uh, all that came from that is that they started importing genetically engineered foods from Canada and the US. They, they were banned to grow, but they were still importing it. Um, it, I'm not sure if Michael means it to like to change the organic, the Canadian organic standard regulations. I think I'm we'll not, see I'm if he, sure if he, he come, that. sure, if he can clarify that and send it in the chat, that would be great. I'm going to ask Bonnie, are there specific nutrients that play a, a crucial role in maintaining uh, psychological health that we should be more aware of? I get this question all the time and I have to give it the answer in two parts, Brandy. Um, and thank you for the question. People are, even my close friends ask me, well, which vitamin should I take, Bonnie? And I always say, you mean minerals and vitamins. The evidence is absolutely the strongest for broad spectrum formulas. And um, if you want, again, email me, I can give you websites of companies. I am not affiliated with any. But uh, the 
there is nothing in the scientific evidence base that comes close to having the impact of a broad spectrum of micronutrients. And now having seen the tryptophan metabolism slide, you should know why. Now that's for mental illness and also for prevention of dementia, by the way, there's a growing literature there. But if you're looking at a healthy population that's going through a stressful time, college students having exam periods, that kind of things, then there is also a very strong body of maybe 10 to 12 randomized placebo control trials on B complex. The B vitamins are very, very important. On the other hand, I've never even heard an anecdote that a B complex um, helps somebody with a depression or anxiety problem overcome that, you know? So that is for more healthy people undergoing ordinary stress. Thank you so much, Bonnie. So Aaron, we have a question for you from Edie Bybart. This is from the audience. Can you speak about the loss of nutritional density in foods over the past 50 to 80 years? Is this something you'd like to speak on? Um, you know, I think it's a really complex question and not something that I have a lot of expertise in. Um, but, you know, because we've been talking about organic versus conventional, I'll speak to that specifically and how there's really not a well, like a scientific consensus about the difference between those two things. In fact, there was two really big systematic reviews that were released this year that together looked at over 300 different studies um, that investigated the differences between organic and conventional food. And the authors in both studies found that it really just depends on way more than production method and that it goes both ways. Some nutrients um, had higher density in organic, some had higher density in conventional. Um, and, the, and the authors of those studies posited that it was for a number of different reasons. And it could just be things like weather year to year. The type of seed varieties that we're developing now are different. There are seasonal differences um, when it comes to nutrient uptake in, in crops. There's differences in fertilizer use. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really complex topic and, and not one that I'm really equipped to, to give details about specifically. But I think that's kind of a good general idea of some of the things that might be impacting the nutrient density of foods. Thank you, Aaron. We have more questions coming in from the audience. This is for Bonnie. This is from Aaron Cote Blackier. Uh, she says, I'm curious about Bonnie's reference to ultra processed chemicals as an unhealthy food choice when also acknowledging that all food is chemical. Is this creating a fear based methodology of evaluating food choices? Well, speaking in shorthand creates fear, and I apologize. Ultra processed food by people who study this sort of thing refers to the various levels of processing. And we, we have standard, we have scales to do that kind of thing. And so what you find in the ultra processed food is lower nutrient density. So when we're trying to help people eat a, a more healthy diet, the, there are even like workshop exercises that we use to teach people at least three of the levels of processing. So unprocessed, like eating an apple, um, uh, moderately processed, like freezing uh, frozen peas, which can be very healthy because they're often flash frozen after harvest. They might be healthier than what you find in the produce section. And ultra processed, which would mean something like apple fruit leather, which has gone through many stages of processing and probably has a lot of additives too. And so the shorthand that's often used is chemical or industrial packaged food. Does that clarify it? Yes, thank you, Bonnie, for sharing that. I have a question for both of you. Um, overall, what is your opinion on the best strategy to help people meet vitamin and mineral needs as a pathway to improve mental health? Should organic food be emphasized? Let's start with Aaron and then Bonnie, you jump on that. So for both, uh, overall, what is your opinion on the best strategy to help people meet vitamin and mineral needs as a pathway to improve mental health? Should organic food be emphasized? Start Aaron, please. Yep. So, um, 
That's a difficult that's a difficult question to ask because it depends on the person is the answer. We have we have social determinants of health. So things that affect people's health and wellness are more than just food. Where they live, their education level, their income level, their access to healthcare, all of these things make a difference in how healthy you can be and the and and your as well as your mental health. In terms of should we emphasize organic food, I think resoundingly the answer is no. We can't even get Canadians to eat enough fruits and vegetables. So the priority should be to get Canadians to eat more fruits and vegetables, regardless of the production method. That's not going to make a big enough difference. Thank you. And Bonnie? Um, I missed part of that because my Bluetooth ears... Okay, I'll repeat it for you. So overall, what is your opinion on the best strategy to help people meet vitamin and mineral needs as a pathway to improve mental health? Should organic food be emphasized? No, um, food first, absolutely. Um, and with all due respect to dietitians who are my heroes because they have the hardest job in the world, uh, it doesn't take a lot to teach people why I mean, just telling people to go eat more vegetables and fruit has not worked for 70 years. So we have to look at a new method. And so that's why I think it's important to teach people what the fruits and vegetables, the nutrients in the vegetables and fruits that Aaron is teaching people to eat, what they're doing in the brain and why it matters. When we teach them why, we motivate them to change their behavior. And yes, their behavior should change to, I totally agree with what uh, Aaron's the part of Aaron's answer I heard, which is yes, eat more vegetables and fruit. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Aaron and Bonnie, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Honestly, I think we could go on for another hour because people are so interested in this topic and you have so much to share, but unfortunately we have to wrap up. So to our participants, you will receive a post-event survey and our next webinar will continue focusing on food labeling and sustainable beef and crop production at the end of October. Please go to the simpsoncenter.ca website. Subscribe to hear more about upcoming events events and receive our monthly newsletter for information based on research about Canadian food production. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, everybody.